So, you know, out of Kentucky, I've had me some nappy roots. And, uh, you know, I, I understand discrimination, and I don't, I don't care for discrimination, and I don't care for racism. And I do, uh, you know, individually uh, check people out. So I, I give everybody the same opportunity to be my friend or to not be my friend. It doesn't matter any of your external characteristics, to be honest with you. But to be honest with you, if I do have a racist strain in my body, it would be against white people. Um, I'm really frustrated with white people. Uh, growing up around racist, it would sound like white people was just a shit, you know. White people just had it all figured out. They were the perfect race. They just knew what was going on. They are pure and good, and there's nothing um, that they ever did that was wrong. They're like the virgin mother queen herself, the white virgin mother queen, right? Um, so, so, white people, um, I got an issue with white people, and I got a nader story um but before that i want to read this david lynch quote david lynch says that we think we understand the rules when we become adults but what we really experience is a narrowing of the imagination by david lynch so uh we think we understand the rules when we become adults but really our imaginations are becoming narrower i thought that was a a pretty good one um there's a couple good ones here. There's never ignore someone who cares for you because someday you'll realize you've lost a diamond while you're busy collecting stones. Those who are unaware they are walking in darkness will never seek the light. So I think that goes along with the Harriet Tubman quote where uh, had slaves knew that they were slaves and Tubman could have rescued thousands more. Be careful who you trust and tell your problems to. Not everyone that smiles at you is your friend. <laughs> There is no elevator to success. Sometimes you have to take the stairs. The, do you buy your pants on sale? Because at my house, they would be 100% off. Anyway, some memes on Facebook. Good friends, don't let you do stupid things alone. <laughs> I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. So, uh, Ralph Nader. Okay, so this is, this is where I started to look at white people different. Uh, I was in Chicago with the Nader campaign in 2008 and it was actually cool to hang out with other progressives other folks that had thought about the issues and policies similar to yourself so I felt at home I felt welcome there and something that we all had noticed um, and I noticed it with work in America as well but it really gained some fruition <laughs> uh, in Chicago um, was that black folks 95 percent time they would sign a petition they would sign a petition to work in America. When you go to a black neighborhood, you knew that you would do well. Black folks were nicer. Black folks were more uh, likely to to help you out. And all you were doing is asking for a signature. I, I'm trying to get a signature here to help health care. I'm trying to get a signature to put Nader on the ballot. So when we were getting signatures to put Nader on the ballot, the same thing was true. 95% of the time, African Americans out of Chicago would sign the petition. So that's in the subways and that's at bus stops and that's – um, you know, where, wherever you can find people. Uh, but why this is significant, because it's Chicago, Chicago, Illinois. Who is born in Chicago? That'd be the President of the United States, Barack Obama. So Barack Obama has been born, was born in Chicago, and uh, this is 2008, the year that we had the first, uh, you know, black president, uh, uh, first black candidate who had a very good chance of becoming president. And um, so even the year of Barack Obama, black folks are still signing Ralph Nader's petition. And signing that petition didn't say that you endorsed Ralph Nader, but that you were saying that he should be allowed to run and he should be allowed on the ballot. He should be allowed to be there. And he should be in a democracy, if, especially with the ballot access struggles that they have to go through. Uh, if you're on a majority of states that you can win the election, then that that means that you're a candidate that if you if it's mathematically possible for you to become president of the United States, then that means you're a viable candidate. Only the media and the presidential commission who controls the debates could say otherwise. Um, and they do. They do say otherwise all the time. But they have a chance. So since they have a chance, that means they should be treated just like anybody else. And the fact that ballot access is harder for independents – uh, versus Republicans and Democrats is ridiculous. Uh, I ran for uh, a state representative, 61st district, and I got two signatures. I ran as a Democrat, and I had to get two signatures in order to get on the ballot. If I was an independent, I would have had to got 5,000 signatures. 5,000 signatures. Same is true for uh, presidential candidates and uh, other candidates. So, 
two signatures versus a thousand. I mean, that's not fair. That's not that's not fair. So that's uh, uh, that, that's where my white racism started. I looked at white people, and 50% of the time, they you didn't know. You couldn't tell. Black people were like, yeah, I would get excited because they'd be down with the cause. And I, I just need a signature. I'm not asking for money. Uh, it's for a good cause. Why wouldn't you do it? I was really convinced of putting him on the ballot. And so why wouldn't you do it? Black folks were down with the cause. But white people, my God, white people were such dicks. It was 50-50 50, 50, 50 shots. So, you know, you give everybody the same opportunity, you know, like I – I did de de develop, like, I guess, a a consciousness for white people, which was not there before. Um, but I started looking at white people differently. I was like, what the hell is wrong with white people? Why are they so stuck up? Why do they act like they got a stick in their ass and that they're better than me? It almost felt like that's what white people were saying. They were, you know, white people that was, like, had a tie and shit. It was like, how dare you talk to me? You know, can't you see that I am, I am white and I am better than you? I am better. Like, they treated me like I was a homeless person, like, begging for change. No, I don't want change, like, uh, any money. I just want your signature on this piece of paper so I can get real change for everybody. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, that's where the my anti-whiteness comes from. Like, but again, you know, 50% of white people are good, too, or are decent folks, just like anyone else. And so I think you should give everybody a chance, regardless of how you generalize, you know, a specific group. So, you know... Just because I'm skeptical of white people, that doesn't mean I throw all white people out with the trash. Um, that's not that's not at all what I do. So uh, yeah. So I've got I've experienced racism, um, uh, dis racial discrimination in the Malcolm X debate club. Straight up, Mary Mudd, who's a huge bigot. Okay, she's a total racist. She's also a low life trailer park white trash. Uh, but she says that I am a white male, so therefore I'm not out on the team. So that she's an oppressor. She's an oppressor. So it's ironic that they would hand me in the academic team or the uh, debate team the pedagogy of the oppressed, and then they would become the oppressors. Uh, you know, they were, they were the oppressors. I also saw two other white males come in saying that they wanted to be on the team, and Mary Mudd was just shitty to them. And then there was this one skinny white uh, gay uh, uh, young man who uh, was, like, giggling afterwards, like, oh, my God, I can't believe he just said that. And it was like, he said what, that he wanted to be on the team? Well, but there was clearly a stigma against white males. And that's that's racist. I think I could have uh, done something about it. I could have – it's not reverse racism. It's just straight-up racism. It's discrimination. She had power. She has – getting. she's getting paid. She has the money. She's got the desk. She's got the better spot. Um, and it's racism. So, you know uh, – Mary Mary Mudd's you know a racist. Later on at a Trayvon Martin event, she got on the microphone. I think she only said it just for me, but she was like, "White people, you all are gonna have to get re ready to get rid of your privilege." And that's right, Mary Mudd, you privileged. You are leading the Malcolm X Debate Club, which makes no sense. You got your blue-eyed white devils where they got better uh, better uh, uh, seating and desk and office materials than the the black coaches. And then all the debaters are in the middle, so they're all just a bunch of, you know, house Negroes. They're just their slaves are in the middle, and then the hierarchy is all around, you know, the three white uh, people. They are behind the apartheid wall, and they're protected, and they got their jobs secured. They're getting paid. They're getting money. Um, and so, yeah, you, you're right. White people should lose their privilege. Specifically, you should lose your privilege. You should lose your job for being so discriminatory. And with that new law that just passed, uh, I don't know, Roberts versus uh, Jefferson County or something, the um, uh, new law where they basically un undid uh, Brown versus Board of Education saying that busing can't be based on race anymore. I think I'd have a suit. I think I'd have a suit against you. You said straight up, yeah, you're white male. You're not going to get here. So, yeah, again, you know, like. No, I'm not black, but where does that put me? Where does that put me when I walk into the Malcolm X Debate Club and I got a white, you know, an overweight white woman who um, is racist and, you know, is probably sexist too, um, discriminating against me? So I'm trying to, you know, like I'm not really relating to the majority of white folks. I go to help uh, or go to, you know, a, a spot where I think would I'd be able to develop myself and I'd also be able to, you know, provide some sort of, uh, resistance to the machine, and then I get discriminated against there. I mean, I feel as though 
um, I'm kind of marginalized and oppressed already as it is, and then by hanging out with the marginalized and oppressed and not being accepted with them, it's making me more marginalized and oppressed. Which is no, it's no thing. I'm, it's like Ender's Game. So that means I'll have to, uh, uh, you know, I'll just have to get better and smarter and better at what it is that I'm doing. But, you know, I think it was bullshit. I think it was bullshit that they were being so racist. I wasn't on the front of the bus. I wasn't on the back of the bus. I wasn't even on the bus at all. And somebody that who walked in after I did, who used to be my partner, but who had got moved up on the team before me, um, was a, a brown-skinned um, person from eastern Kentucky who had a rich life. He had a rich doctor's life, and he did okay. You know, he didn't struggle. He didn't understand, but they went ahead and picked him over me because his skin color was the right color. Uh, they, it's like they didn't understand struggle, they didn't understand poverty, and they didn't understand wanting to stop racism or, or stop, stop white supremacy or to uh, bring about a democratic and fair and cooperative so, uh, society. And maybe that's that. Maybe they were just afraid of me because of that. They passed out these shirts that says democracy begins at home. I would have called for democracy. I would have said, you know, we need to treat each other the same. They watched the great debaters, so they saw Denzel Washington, you know, get all pissed off and be like, you know, don't you dare question my authority. Well, that's back in the 50s, and maybe there was some justification, but even when I was watching that movie, I was wanting that the young man to be like, fuck you, Denzel, you know, fuck you. You're going to yell at me, but I'm a debater. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to debate. You want to sit there and say, don't question your authority? Maybe we should be democratic. Maybe we should actually engage our own minds and learn how to cooperate with each other instead of only understanding life under a dictator. Let's let's learn how to cooperate and get along with each other. So, um, you know, racism can work in, and discrimination can work in many different ways. And like, you know, I mentioned her way, but it's just me being, you know, snarky. I, I really don't care <coughs> um, what size a person is. Uh, but it's just that she makes me mad, so I want to point out anything that I think might get under her skin that I would be pointing out. And she does seem like she's had her share of struggle. So, but instead of, uh, you know, recognizing someone like me, and since we're both white allies, that should make us, you know, good friends. But instead, I think she saw me as competition, and she saw me as somebody else that's taken her role or her spot in the black community. And so she used straight up racism in order to in, in order to push me out. So it's not reverse racism. And, and I stand up to white folks when I hear it. I cannot stand racism, and I think it should go the other way. I think good black folks should stand up uh, against anti-white racism. They're not all bad, you know. That's 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 the same. That's like the same exact um, you know arguments that I was trying to argue with my cousins before I just give up on them. One of them even said, I was like, what if you were born black? And he was like, I would hang myself. Really? Yeah, well, I got 11% African blood in you, and uh, go get a DNA test. See if you're black. And if you're black, then go ahead and do it, since you said you would. I doubt you will, though. David Owens, he was a leading author of whiteness studies, and he drew up seven properties, structuring properties of whiteness. And the first one was a distinction between white and black, and the seventh one was violence. So traditionally, violence had been put on black folks in order to maintain a racial hierarchy, a dictatorship, a totalitarian society. And so the seventh structure of whiteness is violence. That's how the white people are able to maintain their domination. Well, violence is uh, something else that Debo was doing to her child. She was, you know, hitting her kids, and she even made some, some crazy hypothetical where it's like, I had to hit my kids or I was going to die. And I was like, no, that's <laughs> that's... There's no way that, that that actually happened like that. So that's a white thing to do. You want to hit your kids? Well, you're being white. That's how white people maintain the supremacy over black folks. That's how the police and that's how the, uh, the Fugitive Slave Act and that's how they had the white indentured servants. That's how they gained, you know, their uh, false illusion of superiority. So I, I feel like overall there's going to be white supremacists and there's going to be black supremacists and they're both equally stubborn. Um, and I think we should just let the white supremacists and black supremacists do their own thing or fight each other. It doesn't matter. But the rest of us have got to build a better culture, a multicultural society where we recognize our similarities and our differences. We're the same because we're red on the inside. Our women are all pink on the inside. We breathe. We bleed. Uh, we want the best for our children. And, uh, you know, we want, we want to bring a better society for everybody. We want to be tolerant of everyone, and um, we should recognize and be appreciative of our differences. The colors are not exactly right, 
but I'm getting close to the end here, and this is actually a really good thing, but um, I'll do another one. So the colors aren't exactly right. You want to say white and black? These colors aren't even correct. I think uh, you guys are colorblind. <laughs> we already live in a colorblind society because you ain't, you ain't seen the colors the way I see colors.